Hello, and welcome to another episode of Health Affairs This Week, the podcast where health affairs editors go beyond the headlines to explore some of the most notable health policy news of the week. I'm Kathleen Haddad. And I'm Chris Fleming. Today, we've decided to take a look at recent health policy litigation. We'll look at three issues which have been prominent in the past weeks and months. In one set of cases, providers are challenging federal rules governing their payments under the No Surprises Act, the law enacted last year to ban surprise medical bills. Another conflict also concerns provider payment, specifically whether and when consumers can count the value of drug manufacturer coupons towards their deductibles and out-of-pocket maximums. A third issue involves a challenge to ACA's preventive services coverage mandate. So, Chris, let's start with the litigation around the No Surprises Act, or the NSA. Last week, the Texas Medical Association sued the Biden administration again over the NSA's independent dispute resolution process, and this came after a string of lawsuits about the same topic. Let's recall that the NSA prohibits out-of-network doctors and other providers from, in most circumstances, billing patients at rates higher than in-network amounts. It seems, however, that surgeons and anesthesiologists, among other providers, are not happy with the process set up by the government to resolve dis- disputes over what insurers should pay these providers when there's no network fee scale to go by. Chris, what's happening with this litigation? Well, it's as they, as I think it was Yogi Berra used to say, it's deja vu all over again, Kathleen. Uh, as you mentioned, the previous, like the previous case brought by the Texas Medical Association, this current lawsuit uh, focuses on the NSA's Independent Dispute Resolution, or IDR. Uh, it focuses on that framework, which, as you alluded to, is the arbitration mechanism that decides how much a payer, like an insurer or an employer plan, uh, will pay an out-of-network provider. Uh, and the IDR uh, in the No Surprises Act is what's known as baseball-style arbitration, uh, which means that both sides pick a number, uh, and the arbitrator picks one or the other. There's no compromising or averaging or that sort of thing. So I get the uh, Yogi Berra reference, Chris. <laughs> I, I wish I could claim that I was that clever. It was accidental. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, more specifically, and also like the earlier case, uh, the, this current suit focuses on something called the qualifying payment amount, or QPA, and that's roughly what the payer's median rate is for in-network uh, for the service involved in the same geographic area and the same market. Now, there was a interim rule previously that the Biden administration had issued to implement the NSA that established a, quote, rebuttable presumption, unquote, in favor of the QPA. And all that meant was that the arbitrator should choose the number closest to the QPA as the payment amount, unless one of the parties, and usually the provider, offered good evidence that the QPA was not the appropriate out-of-network amount. So in that earlier case, uh, Texas Federal District Court Judge Jeremy Kernoodle agreed with the Texas Medical Association that the rebuttable presumption gave too much of a privileged position to the QPA, more than the statute, more than the NSA intended. Now, in response to that decision, the Biden administration issued a new rule, a new final rule that eliminated the rebuttable presumption. But the TMA has sued again, claiming the new rule still gives too much prominence to the QPA. And the suit is not only back in federal district court in Texas, but it's in fact back in front of Judge Kernoodle. Now, one thing I want to emphasize Uh, However this turns out, it's important to know consumers will still be protected by the NSA from surprise medical bills. But what could happen if the Texas Medical Association is ultimately successful in this new litigation, what that could mean is higher awards from IDR cases and thus higher health care costs. So, Chris, what you're saying is, if I understand this, is that the government did what the plaintiffs wanted but the plaintiffs are still not happy. Do you know what they're asking for now? Well, they're basically asking for uh, the uh, any sort of privileged position on for the QB, uh, QPA to be eliminated. Uh, they basically uh, want uh, an unbiased. They they view the QPA as biased towards insurers and and uh, payers, uh, and they want what they think of as an even playing field where the QPA is not given any sort of preference. 
Okay. So let's move on to another payment issue in the courts. Several weeks ago, a coalition led by the HIV and Hepatitis Policy Institute, consumer advocates, filed suit here in D.C. Federal District Court against pharmacy benefit managers. They said the PBMs won't count the value of their coupons for expensive drugs such as HIV prophylactic treatment. They won't count it toward a consumer's deductible or annual out-of-pocket maximum. So that means, as I understand it, that patients get help paying for the drugs, but they can end up paying huge amounts in the long run anyway in deductibles until they reach their annual maximum, which is often tens of thousands of dollars. So what's this legal conflict about, Chris? Ah, yes. Uh, this is uh, can get complex even by health policy standards. So these programs that are involved here that are controversial are known as accumulator adjustment programs or sometimes copay accumulator programs. Uh, as you know, the drug companies sometimes provide coupons or cards to help consumers pay cost sharing requirements for brand name drugs. Now, on the plus side, what that can do, uh, helping with cost sharing can make it more probable that uh, consumers will take the drugs as intended, uh, which and that could be particularly a big deal when you're talking about chronic conditions. On the flip side, these programs can also undermine uh, incentives and formularies to use cheaper generic drugs, and that encourages consumers to use the more expensive brand name drugs, which in turn can increase healthcare costs. So, so Chris, let me just say the other flip side that I'm aware of is that once these coupon programs end, they're often time limited, then consumers or patients may stop using their medication or try, try to spread it out. Um, but that's not a legal issue. So let's get back to that. Well, that is, but that is true that sometimes these assistance, the the, the uh, amount of assistance from the drug companies are capped, and when if the uh, consumer hits that cap, what you're talking about happens that uh, they all of a sudden are, are hit with these huge bills, and and that can that can impact compliance at that point. Mm -hmm. So th there's a little bit of a, a checkered history here that uh, in the final uh, 2020 payment rule, the Trump administration basically banned accumulator adjustment programs for brand name drugs uh, where there wasn't a generic version available. But then a few months later, they delayed enforcement of that policy. And in the next payment rule, the 2021 payment rule, they reversed course completely and allowed accumulator adjustment programs in all cases. Now, uh, states, some states, though, have actually banned these programs uh, for the fully insured uh, health plans that are under their jurisdiction. Now, in this litigation, uh, Kathleen, the plaintiffs are arguing uh, that the copay accumulator policy uh, included in the 2021 payment notice, which basically allowed them, uh, that that's unlawful on a number of grounds. It conflicts with the ACA and agency regulations. Uh, and they also claim it's arbitrary and capricious under the Administrative Procedure Act. So this is becoming clearer to me. I hope it is to our listeners as well. There is another uh, court case, a recent significant decision affecting the ACA's preventive services coverage mandate, right, Chris? Can you tell us about that? Uh, I can. Um, now, this is uh, the the mandate is in Section 2713. It requires health plans to cover without consumer cost sharing preventive services that are approved by various bodies, including, most relevant to this case, the United States Preventive Services Task Force. Most of the litigation regarding Section 2713 has involved challenges to the contraceptive coverage mandates that have arisen from that, uh, and those challenges have been based on religious freedom claims. Uh, this recent case, however, offers a little bit of a different take. Uh, the plaintiffs, among other claims, and the plaintiffs, a, a group of companies and individuals, argued that the task force and other bodies uh, charged by the ACA with approving preventive services, uh, that, it, that they violate the appointments clause of the Constitution. Now, that doesn't come up all that often compared to some of the other provisions in the, in the Constitution. It requires officers of the United States to be appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. Uh, Judge Reed O'Connor, who is a repeat player uh, in the ACA litigation world and once famously held the entire ACA unconstitutional, he agreed uh, in the case of the Preventive Services Task Force. Uh, he found that the power granted by 2713 
to the task force to determine what preventive services must be covered. That made the task force members officers of the U.S. Uh, since the members were appointed by the head of ARC, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and not the president, he held that the appointments clause was, in fact, violated. Now, he didn't find uh, constitutional violations for the other bodies, like the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, uh, because there were slightly different circumstances there. Okay. So, Chris, you mentioned there was a, a religious freedom aspect in this case or some related cases. Is there one in this case specifically? There is indeed. Uh, now, one of the plaintiffs uh, argued that requiring him to cover PrEP, which is a daily antiviral medication that helps prevent uh, high-risk individuals from getting HIV, that that violated his rights under the, something called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Uh, he claimed that, that the covering this drug, or he claimed that this drug facilitates sex, same-sex sexual relations and sexual activity outside marriage, and that violated his religious beliefs. And again, again, Judge O'Connor agreed. He said that the PrEP coverage mandate did not meet the RIFRA requirement that if you're going to substantially burden someone's religious uh, practice uh, and belief, that that meant that you had to have choose the least restrictive means of achieving a compelling government objective. Uh, so he cited a statement by Justice Alito in the Supreme Court case of Hobby Lobby a few years back, uh, and he's, where uh, Justice Alito had said in that case that the government, if it wanted to, could directly fund contraceptives. And in this case, Judge O'Connor said the government could have just directly funded PrEP. Now, it's not clear how far Justice or Judge O'Connor's rulings will extend, uh, whether they'll go beyond the parties uh, in the case and maybe uh, apply on a national basis, and if so, whether he'll stay his ruling uh, pending appeal. So, so Kathleen, now we've, of course, covered these cases very quickly. We've left out a lot of details. I would really encourage listeners to read the full health affairs forefront write-ups of the lawsuits if they haven't already. Uh, and, of course, these three cases we've talked about, they're only a smattering of uh, the usual smorgasbord of health policy lit litigation that's out there. Uh, just one more example I'll point listeners to in its upcoming term. The Supreme Court will consider the case of Health and Hospital Corp v. Tulefsky, uh, and that's a huge case that could determine whether Medicaid enrollees uh, can continue accessing the courts when they believe states have violated their constitutional rights. Chris, thank you for your legal um, clarity on these issues. These are all complicated legal matters. So let's wrap up for now and give our listeners some time to absorb it. Thanks for tuning in. Please leave us a review. And if you like this episode, please tell a friend and subscribe to Health Affairs This Week, wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Kathleen. And thanks, everyone.